So I'm so happy to be here. You know why? It was so cold when I left. I think it's still so cold in Salt Lake. It was like below 10, okay, the last one week. So I came here, I'm just having just sweated. And that feels so good. So today we're gonna to cover two different topics. One is angiogenesis. And so I'm gonna give you a broad overview about angiogenesis. And then of course here and there you can see how the GAGs, uh, glycine and glycans playing a role, okay, in angiogenesis, you're gonna see that, and how it's linked to the coagulations, how it's linked to the inflammation, and how it's linked to the cancer, and then how this knowledge can then be used to develop a therapeutic agents or a molecule that can intervene on genetic process. And so angiogenesis is very complex, very complex, okay, uh, biological, natural process, and also it's pathological process, and we know a lot of those things, and also we don't know so much unknown. And so there's a saying in the culture where I've grown up, like you go to the sand, okay, beach, pick the sand, okay, in your hands. So however much you can take, you take. That's all you can hold. How much is left inside, outside? There's so much is outside is left that you can't scoop with your hands. So knowledge that we have right now, we think so much we have, but so much is unknown. And so that's the message that I hopefully would like to convey uh, towards the end of this okay, meeting. And the, okay, the second topic that I'm gonna cover about, sialic acid. So this is an unusual carbohydrate, which occupies often the terminal position of various glycoconjugates and regulates pathophysiological process. And so the two distinct topics we're gonna cover, the first one is angiogenesis. So, you all know what is angiogenesis by definition, right? Is angiogenesis is the process by which you develop the blood vessels. Uh, and so this is for, okay, uh, lay language and as angiogenesis development of blood vessels. There's so many fundamental steps involved in making blood vessels. And so there's a paper that talks about as many as 28 biological steps involved. One would be differentiating the stem cells into becoming progenitor cells for endothelial cells. Then endothelial cells then uh, start uh, multiplying, proliferating, uh, and, and also they should proliferate in specific directions. They should form a two-dimensional layer, 2D layer, uh, or 3D layer, whatever you call. And then they have to fold themselves, and then they have to extend, forming the tubes, and then they have to branch, and then they have to rewire again themselves. It's not like it's disconnected uh, tubes coming out from different places. And they also have to penetrate into various tissues, as matrices, and then integrate, and then connect all the organs. Because all the organs in our body, brain, lung, heart, kidney, liver, and the peripheral tissues, as skin, all needs the nutrients. And the nutrients means oxygen, water, food, and the carbon skeletons like glucose. So all the nutrients, energy that you need for the cells to survive, it has to come from uh, the blood vessels that carry this nutrients and oxygen and energy that you need to get from. So this angiosis is a very, very important process that has to penetrate as many cells and tissues as possible. That's why the organs can survive and hence organisms can survive. So it's a complex biological process, but it's a fundamental process. Without that, we won't be here today. And there's so many molecules involved there's thousands of molecules involved, proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates, and some of which are listed, and like FGFs, some of you know like about fibroblast growth factors, uh, vascular endothelial uh, factors, the TGF beta alpha, IL1s, IL6, and IL8, I'm sure Krishna's group would be interested in IL8, and they also play a role in angiogenesis and PDGF, hepatocyte growth factors, tumor necrosis factors, histamines, and keeps going on, and also various integrins and uh, uh, adhesive proteins, and uh, also like uh, ion channels, which is not listed here, and then proteases and protease inhibitors, plus last but not the least one that we are interested, proteoglycans. And proteoglycans composed of uh, glycosaminoglycan side chains, could be HS, chondritin sulfate, or dermatin sulfate, or keratin sulfate, then attached to the cold proteins called proteoglycan. So many, many more things are involved, but some of which are listed here. And one way or other, these factors are known to interact with the proteoglycans. That's why these things 
uh, tabulated together and shown here. And so, can you tell me two places where the angiosis is uh, therapeutically important? Wound healing. So when someone has cut, deep cut, obviously you're cutting not only the skins and the nerves and depending on how deep it is, okay, obviously you're affecting the blood vessels. And that's why you have bleeding and then eventually the healing takes place, occurs, and then you clog, okay, the, wherever you have cut, the skin closed. But you don't want to close the blood vessels. You want to make the blood vessels again regrown and wired so the blood can start flowing. Otherwise, I have a cut here there won't be any more blood is flowing in, which is not good. So wound healing is a place where the angiogenesis is very important. And another place is like someone have a heart attack. So the blood flow to the heart is affected, okay, the, then there's no blood circulation. So all it takes, just a few minutes, you stop the blood flow to any organ, and the organs start die. okay, the cells start dying, okay, because they need constantly oxygen. Even while you're sleeping, you need oxygen. Okay, you still breathe, and because then the breathing, then oxygen takes into the lung, from lung it goes into all places from heart. And so, when someone had a heart attack, the faster they can get to the emergency room, I really mean, okay, within 15, 20 minutes, the chance of survival and the chance of improving faster is really dramatically improves. If you will wait for it often over 45, you can ask surgeons, okay, or the doctors, physicians, they tell you, or someone in your family had a heart attack, and the faster they can get to the emergency room, the chance of recovery is much better and faster. The more you delay, it can cause a dramatic damage. So this, okay, and this is a heart attack, and then the flow of blood is stopped. Then you do the surgery, and then you can recreate, okay? But the thing is that the most important that you already have caused enough damage to the organs. So then again, you need to trigger the angiogenesis, and the cardiomyocytes need to just you know, grow well again, so start pumping the blood, they have to functional. So they need to have, again, the blood vessels grown. And there, again, the angiosis is really, really important. And we can do that. And so where you don't want angiogenesis, this is still unfortunately happening. One would be in eye, retinol, where you don't want to have angiogenesis happening because the blood vessels grown towards your eye, retinol. Then what happens is that you start having the macular degenerations the vision problems happen. So you want to keep our lenses very transparent. And uh, so the blood vessels drawn towards the lens, then it is going to impact our vision. So you don't want to have the blood vessels grown. And okay, then that causes a problem where you want to have opposite effect. You don't want to have blood vessels grown in retinol. Other place where you don't want to have blood vessels is obviously is a cancer. Okay, the normal cell for some reasons become very odd behavior and start growing in uncontrolled manner. Most tissues of cells have okay, a growth phenomena that is controlled by where they are located and how much they can grow and how fast they can grow. And also they have an apoptosis pathway to trigger the cell death. That's why the most cells are made and constantly die, except the nervous system, so where the cells don't so not die because we don't have a able to regenerate most of the time. Whereas when the cells do not have this behavior of controlling their growth, then they're transformed, then it became a tumor, then they have uncontrolled growth. And there, what happens, are any cells to grow, it doesn't matter, normal cell or tumor cell to grow, they need the nutrients. Again, what happens is that most of us, okay, normal physiology conditions been angiostatic, okay? We don't keep growing blood vessels unless we need that, okay? And what happens in tumor, and the body is supposed to be angiostatic, now, now some parts of the body, now the tumor cells start multiplying, growing. What happens is now takes us backwards in lifetime, like in embryogenesis, okay, during embryonic development, the blood vessels developing, and now this tumor starts releasing factors that start stimulating the blood vessels and trying to mimic the embryogenic state, okay, and therefore drawing the blood vessels towards them, and therefore they can take the nutrients and sucking the nutrients from the blood by developing new blood vessels called neoangiogenesis. And so that's a place where you don't want to have blood vessels grow in tumor. So here and there we can see how the tumor, but the thing is that even though this is not we wanted the tumor okay, angiogenesis, but by using the tumor angiogenesis, we'll learn more about what are the factors that control angiogenesis. And we have developed so much knowledge, not from so much from 
embryogenesis, okay, from uh, angiogenesis that happens during embryonic development. But we learn so much from the tumor associated angiogenesis. So we're gonna learn uh, today in the lecture, even though mostly about angiogenesis, but I think that you can learn more from the tumor angiogenesis. And so before we move on in detail about the things, and I would like to give some basic introductions about angiogenesis. And so you should not get confused between angiogenesis and what is happening with the tubulogenesis. So what happens that in the very first stage, and uh, you have angioblast that comes from stem cells. Now they're now dedicated themselves to become uh, the blood vessels, and they become angioblast. This angioblast eventually uh, differentiate in to give the endothelial cells. There's so many steps involved. We don't still understand how this happens, the whole steps. But once you have endothelial cells, now the endothelial cells proliferating, they still be in touch with each other, and then they start folding themselves, and all like they, they're making the massive uh, the tissue, like structures like a cord, okay? And then what happens, you do hollowing, okay? Like you're scooping out the things inside, and then you start forming the tube. And this is called vasculogenesis, or tubulogenesis, vasculogenic tubulogenesis. And then what happens, so you don't have just a tube-like molecule, okay, the structure. And then you want to have a branching. And then you want to have a sprouting. And then you want them to wire and connect and they integrate with the tissues and uh, organs. And that's when you want to have a branching. And that's the place what they call is angiogenic tubulogenesis. And this what happens is that some cells, what they call tip cells, endothelial tip cells, and then they sense the environmental factors and they start proliferating and extending and protruding away from the primary uh, okay, tube, and then uh, they start okay, differentiating and then start forming uh, the tube-like structures eventually, as you can see that. And this is what they call angiogenesis. And uh, so we have tube-like structures, other organs as well, other places as well. And one is made by epithelial cells, which is shown here. And the endothelial tube, okay, that's basically forms or blood vessels are shown here. By looking at here one, you can see two differences. Right? You can see the differences. In the epithelial cells, the cells, okay, they have the borders, right? Everybody has the border and their uh, the control of area, cell membranes. And they have an epical side and basolateral side and the lateral side. So all those cell sites communicating with the neighboring cell, that's how they know where they are. And so here the epithelial cells have the epical side and all what they call okay, luminal side which is what is in contact okay, with uh, the flow of molecules and uh, fluids. And if you look at in epithelial tubes, how they look like? It's like, uh, it's like when you take something that you can scoop out, like uh, cut it, they have a very nice edge, you can see that. Well-defined surface, apical and basolateral, and also like the lateral side. But if you look at the endothelial uh, tubes, which is basically forms of blood vessels, they don't have a very nice cuts. And actually, if you look at the lateral side, which is basically forms a cell junks and cell-cell contact, and they have a very nice contact here, okay? But here, the junctions, okay, are so tiny. And actually, this is good, because that's how the immune cells, okay, would be able to crash from the blood vessels and across uh, the endothelial cells into the place where you have inflammation is happening, the leukocytes are recruited. And that said, you don't want to have a leaky place. If it's leaky, then that's not good. So in order to prevent the leakiness of the blood vessels, what happens is that they also recruit other cells, like a pericytes, also smooth muscle cells. So the smooth muscle cells and the pericytes would come and cover the endothelial cells and gives you extra layer of protection for the blood vessels and it stabilizes the blood vessels, which is more critical when you have particularly major blood vessels, like arteries, okay, that take so much blood from the, the blood. And the major arteries and, and the major veins, you really need to have the smooth muscle cells and the pericytes, and that provides the stability for the endothelial cells. How much blood you're pumping in? Five liters of blood, okay? Per second, like, okay, so much blood pressure that you have and the blood vessels have to really withstand this very high pressure. It's really a very high pressure. That's how it can penetrate all the way down to our feet, to our brain, and everywhere. And okay, 
so that for that they need to withstand the high pressure. So that uh, high pressure is withstand not only by having the tight junctions between the endothelial cells and also extra layer of protections, backup lines by endothelial uh, cells with us. smooth muscle cells and pericytes. So, so this is a fundamental difference between epithelial tubes and also with the endothelial tubes. And uh, so here, the glycans or glycans plays a major role and also proteins such as adherins, adhesive proteins, and uh, also uh, E-cadherins and N-cadherins, which are ad adhesive proteins, and they have the glycans, and so those adhesive proteins, by interacting with the glycan chains, gives a very tight junctions, thereby preventing the leakness of the blood vessels, and also by recruiting the pericytes and endothelial, okay, with also the smooth muscle cells, and they provide the stability, and for that, you need to have a glycan or glycans and different, uh, gag, uh, different glycan chains. So this one, okay, this slide talks about how this hollowing or uh, like, uh, or creating the space that the results in forming the tubes. And there are two different ways this can happen. One would be once you have the massive endothelial cells proliferation happens, it forms cord-like structure, right? This forms this one. And then what happens is that each cell then in parallel triggers uh, uh, vacuolus, what, what they call vacuole formations. You take in the cytosols, okay, the cytoplasms, and then they put them all in vesicles and they fuse themselves and create the empty space in each cell. This, they call cell hollow. This is happening in parallel everywhere. And then eventually they all get connected and the results eventually transforming in forming uh, the hollow that results in forming the tubes and that's how the blood will start growing, uh, flowing in. Another one is called cord hollowing, in which what happens is that the cells themselves adjust and getting some small slits, small holes, okay? And that happens between the two different cell surfaces. You can see multiple places happening. And then uh, what happens is that eventually, it's like peeling the orange skin, right? When you take the orange, they take the skin out. Like that, you make the hole someplace, and then it's trying to peel it. And that's exactly happening here. But of course, this hollowing is happening. And so what is the process that actually happening? Both of them happening, both cell hollowing and cord hollowing is happening. And here is a place where people have shown and the gags and adhesive proteins and uh, could play a role, but it's still not well documented, it's speculated. And we're gonna see in the next few slides how this is happening. So, in other words, one would be cell hollowing, can, we can also call as the intracellular lumen formations, and in which integrin CDC42 and other molecules involved uh, leads in pinocytosis that results in uh, cell hollowing. Another one is that, as, as I said, it has the slit, okay, small holes is makes between the two cells and making the gaps, and then that extended, and then that results in forming uh, the, uh, the cord hollowing, that's called extracellular lumen formation. And then eventually they start recruiting uh, the pericytes and the smooth muscle cells. And uh, so where uh, this, uh, the, the hollowing or the lum lumen formation, the gags or other things play a role. And there's so many different proteins are, okay, are involved, okay? And some of which are listed here, you can see that. Most of those proteins also interact with glycan or glycan chains. So this slide discussed in detail some of the most steps involved. So by using the Drosophila as a model system, there's a group shown that the heart lumen formation in which there's a molecule called roboslate, okay? So roboslate, so robo is a receptor, the slit is a protein ligand, and this roboslate interactions is very critical for the blood vessels, the pattern formation. And the roboslate is also important in another place in action guidance because the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body, and the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. If I'm using my arms, this one, my right brain controls this, okay, ask me to move my hands, my arms, fingers. And now I'm doing this, this body, okay, part of the brain controls this one. So for that to happen, the trillions of neurons are wired. And uh, this is not one or two or three or four or five or thousands or millions, you're talking not billions, trillions of neurons are wired. And that wiring requires during early stages of development, okay, and these neurons are connected. And they need to know which neuron they have to be wired. 
If you miswire, what happens? You don't want that to happen. So the wiring is very, very critical. And uh, so then the neurons should know when to cross the midline, the left right axis that we have left right axis, they should know when to cross. And it seems like, not seems like, the roboslate interactions, robo is a receptor which is expressed by migrating cells, like the neuronal cells. Slate is a protein which is ligand, protein ligand secreted either by the extracellular matrix and neighboring cells or the neuronal cells. And those roboslate interactions would tell whether you are a welcome partner or you're supposed not to be here. And the same roboslate interactions has also been shown to be critical here. Not so, okay, uh, in two different places. One would be in cell hollowing and, okay, uh, and also in pattern formation. And uh, so they give the guidance for the blood vessels uh, to move in a specific directions and so forth. And so that's the roboslate. And where the gag come to play a role? So the roboslate interactions, like FGF, FGF receptor interactions, are happening much better, okay, happening okay, in a likely manner that you wanted in the presence of heptan sulfate. So heptan sulfate is a sulfated polysaccharide naturally charged molecule. And when this roboslate interactions happens, this interaction sometimes is weak, sometimes strong. You want to keep it that way because you don't want to have a strong interaction. When these things happen, they realize that, oh, I don't want to be here, then they should be able to withdraw so quickly. If the interaction is so strong, it's already happened, it's become irreversible, that's not good. So often the biological process interactions are very weak. And they like to see each other, they, they, this is the right place to be and the right partner to be. If they are, then other factors come in and stabilizes those interactions. And the heptan sulfate happens to be playing the role of stabilizing the interactions. And thereby, once it becomes a fruitful, they know that this is good, then the heparan sulfate kicks in and stabilizes those interactions. And so this is the place where the heparan sulfate suggests to play a role in stabilizing the roboslate interactions. And that is actually it's not attractive interaction, it's a repulsive interactions, and thereby it ripples and it gives a shape and lumen formation. And another molecule is called cadenin, cadherin and e cadherin There's two different cadherin One is the e endothelial specific cadherin Another one is called n cadherin One is expressed on the apical side of the blood vessel and the one that forms a lumen. You also have an n cadherin which is opposite side of this one on this side and that gives you cell polarity. So basically roboslid and the e cadherin gives you cells to polarize themselves to realize which side is apical or which side is a luminal. The luminal side is the one where the blood is flowing. Okay? And so we keep in mind the cell now is just differentiated in endothelial cells from angioblast. It has no directions. It doesn't know which is the luminal, which is apical, or which is the basal lateral, and which one is going to eventually recruiting. So it has no directions, okay? And so for that, okay, then what happened? It has to be polarized. So cells should know immediately, okay, I'm going to now forming the blood flow direction this side. This is going to be lumen, okay? And this is going to be apical side. And so they need to polarize themselves. So the, how they can polarize? So by bringing in molecules onto the cell surface on one side, and then scooping the other molecules on the other side of the cell surface, and thereby they can polarize and they can make the cells to distinguish themselves. This is a lumen and okay, or the apical side, the basolateral side. Still, we don't know a lot of things, but we know some things, okay? And so now this side is gonna become lumen. Working. So the green one is a robust slate. That's where they're localized. And then the flank to buy uh, this E cadherin molecules and E cadherins, okay, endothelial cadherins, the adhesive proteins, and they're glycosylated. So the glycans of the E cadherin on this one would interacting with E cadherin on this side. And so E cadherin is a glycosylated protein. It have a lectin like okay, domains. So lectins are the proteins which bind to carbohydrates. So e cadherin, it has the glycans. The glycans of the e cadherin on this one will be interacting with the lectin domains of the e cadherin on this side, and thereby now they can fuse, they can interact, they have addition happens, okay? And now the same thing happens here. And then this robust slit interaction domain that is here, and that repel the cells each other. And now that results in forming the lumen. So what happens when the robust slit is not expressed? Either the robo or slate or both are 
you affect the robo-slick interaction result in signaling. And if you block the signaling, and what happens that now we can see that the lumen formation is not very effective. Now the cells are fused. And that means that the blood vessels are not going to be having enough uh, lumens, okay, enough okay, hollowing, and therefore what happened that there won't be enough blood flow. Of obviously, this is going to be a lethal. The organism won't survive. And also, how this robustly interaction takes place is still not quite clear, but it can happen through two different pathways. One would be paracrine, another one would be autocrine. So one would be the paracrine means that the slit is secreted by these endothelial cells would get the repulsions like interacting with the robo of the neighboring cells and that can repel each other. This is called paracrine when the neighboring cells can control each other or they can secrete the mole factor and they can control their own behavior. It's called autocrine. But the same cell secretes something that interacts with the same receptor robo and then thereby you can make the cells to repel each other. And so it can happen through either pathway. We don't know exactly. And also, they have other roles as well, both roboslin and eukaryote. It can also change the, the cell shape. And if you look at the wild type cells here, and now as they start forming the lumens, they're bending, they're changing the shape of the cells here. Whereas in the mutants, and it appears that there's not big change in the cell shape. And basically that prevents them uh, because of compromised roboslit interactions and signaling, and there's no dramatic changes in the cell shape. As a result, okay, now they lose their ability to have the lumen formation, and hence it affects. And you can see that the lumen shape in the wild type is nicely formed here. They are somewhat crooked, they're not stable, and so forth. So this slide talks about how from angioblast that you talk with, then forming uh, the uh, tubes, vasculogenesis, then having sproutings happening, and then most important that at some point, they not only take the blood into the organs, they should also take the blood backwards from the organs back into the uh, system and then into the lung eventually. Then they will be exchanging carbon dioxide with oxygen and then getting into the heart from that. So for that, you need to have arteries taking the pressed blood with the nutrients rich with the glucose and oxygen into the various organs. And the veins are the one that taking the blood which has less oxygen and more carbon dioxide and then taking them back into the lung where they will be exchanging. And so we don't know how the blood vessels can, be, one become arteries, one becomes a vein. And then they have to be wired and connected. If they're not wired, then you're taking the blood and then just what happens? It just gets spilled, no, that's not good. And so what happened, there's a complex wiring between arteries and vein. There's a uh, area, a junction, where the arteries have more branching and therefore they can diffuse the nutrients very easily. And then also they can take the carbon dioxide back very quickly and then they get you know merge back into vein and there's so many specific proteins are expressed on the surface of the endothelial cells which become arteries which become vein and uh, and it seems that the gags play a role but still we don't understand much about it there are differences between uh, specific syndicants and glyphicants which are expressed in arteries versus vein and but again it's done with the model systems and some small group reported some place, and then there is no follow-up studies, but there are fragmented knowledge available in the literature with many different model systems that in arteries, there are specific glypicans and syndicants expressed, but the different syndicants and glypicans are expressed in the vein. So basically, that suggests that the GAGs have a role. We don't know whether it's a bystanding effect it has or it is meant to have a specific effect, but definitely we can see the differences in the GAGs that are expressed in arteries as vein. So this slide basically brings directly into the role of GAGs in the blood vessel pattern formation and like nice network that you have arteries and vein and branching and how the pattern formation. And uh, so what happened that uh, there's a group that found that there's a thing called microRNA. You all know about microRNA. It's a small RNA which is expressed by cells we don't understand still. And there's several hundreds of microRNA exist. And those microRNA is basically this is an RNA. It's a single standard RNA. What, what it does, microRNA, some of you don't know what this is, it is. So the microRNA is a small RNA fragments. We don't know exactly how this happens. And uh, so now this small RNA fragments gets secreted. Uh, not secreted means from, uh, gets uh, formed. 
Then what happens is that this microRNA, small fragments, binds to three prime and translated region, okay? You have a gene, right? The DNA. That becomes RNA, then becomes eventually protein. So you have a five prime region that becomes the N terminal of the protein. You have a three prime region that becomes the C terminal of the protein. And then you have also five prime region untranslated, and that's where the transcription factors can bind, then that can trigger the transcriptions, the DNA becomes RNA, and then when the RNA is made, it also makes a little bit more extra part, okay, on the three prime side, which is not going to be coded, untranslated region, okay, which is not going to become protein, but it still gives some stability for the RNA, mRNA. So that three prime untranslated region has some extra domains. And this microRNA, this single stranded RNA, binds to the three prime region uh, beyond the coding region, okay, untranslated region, and then that destabilizes or stabilizes. And in this case, this microRNA called microRNA 218, this small fragment and binds to certain RNA and destabilizes and thereby prevents the translation of an enzyme called GLCE and this GLCE stands for glucuronic acid epimerase. You all know, some of you know, the C5 epimerase is the enzyme which converts the iodonic acid into glucuronic acid, sorry, glucuronic acid into iodonic acid by converting the configuration of the C5 position. And this enzyme is very, very critical. And because iodonic acid is required for binding to FGF, is required for binding to VEGF, is required for binding to a number of other proteins. And antithrombin requires at least one iodonic acid, two of iodonic acid. And uh, so this C5 epimerase, which catalyzes the conversion of uh, heparin sulfate, glucuronic acid, iodonic acid, and also this RM, uh, microRNA 218, not only affects the uh, epimerase, it also happens to affect 6-OST enzyme, which does the 6 sulfation of uh, heparin sulfate. And also, to some extent, it affects the 3 o sulfation of heparin sulfate as well, 3 o 3 in particular. So it affects the C5 epimerase, it affects the 6 o sulfation, 6 o ST enzyme, and 3 o sulfotransferase isoform 3 in particular. And thereby, what happens is that uh, this heparin sulfate is recorded, as you know, as I told you, uh, to stabilize the robo-slit interactions. And so, but now this microRNA 218, which blocks the expression of C5 epimerase, and also 6 o ST and 3 o ST 3 enzyme, and thereby, what happens is that now these enzymes are not translated or they're not produced enough quantity, and therefore, now you have a totally different heparin sulfate structure. And the heparin sulfate, which is less ephemerized, which doesn't have enough 6 sulfate, it doesn't have enough 3 O sulfate groups. Keep in mind, 3 O sulfate, after all, is a rare modification. In 100 sulfate groups, you may have only one or two 3 O sulfate groups, but that still may be very important. And so now, this heparin sulfate which lacks uh, uh, iodonic acid and 6O and 3O, now is not quite efficient in regulating robo-slit interactions. And now the robo-slit interactions now is stabilized to by the heparin sulfate. Now they can't stabilize the robo-slit interactions. As a result, now what happened that it doesn't have a nice blood vessel pattern formation. Isn't it so interesting? Like a microRNA, which affects the translation of the enzymes involved in making heparin sulfate, the way you modify the structures by affecting the specific heparin sulfate, and now you affect the robo-slit interactions, and therefore now you lose the ability to form the pattern formations, blood vessels. And so of course this is embryonically lethal, and when they're expressed too much of it, what happened, of course they're expressed, the reason is that once the pattern formation occurs, you don't want them to just go backwards into your pre-embryonic state or like the pre-vessel formation state. Because once the vessel's formed, you will want to maintain the patterns. You don't want to have a robust that comes back and tells it, oh, well, okay, you don't, you don't belong here. Then what happens is trying to start rippling it, which is not good. So that's why you want to have angiostatic. So production of microRNA, now after establishing the pattern formation, it now prevents unnecessary signaling that could have an unknown, okay, means unwanted effect. Therefore, the microRNA production is natural, it's not pathological, but once you overexpress in the very early stages of development, now this is, now that's how we learned that the heparin sulfate, uh, which is production is regulated by this microRNA, which affects interaction and hence it affects endothelial cell migration and pathfinding and hence the pattern formation, blood vessels in particular.
So another aspect of that I want to talk is still is very fascinating to me. And, uh, and so this is the blood vessel that you have. Yes. Um, so for, for angiogenesis, um, this HSPV segregates robustly, or you said it's a repulsive interaction. So repulsive interaction means what? Like it, they're moving away from each other through HSPV, or yeah, like in, uh, in like physical scenario. How yeah. So I said the robust, okay, robust slate, okay, robo is a receptor. The question is how exactly hepatin sulfate okay, gives you repulsion. This is like physical repulsion and uh, or what, right? That's the question. Right, right, right. Like yeah. Be because you said that for angiostasis, static, um, HSPV has different um, hepatin sulfate uh, content. I mean like low 3 OSD or 6 OSD, mm -hmm. high percentage of glucuronic acid. So now interaction is strong and hence angiostatic scenario. Now, for the angiogenesis, it is the other way around, right? Yes. So there is repulsion. So repulsion means there is no interaction between ligand and receptor, or? Yeah, OK. So, so let me just clarify exactly what's happening. So robo is a receptor that interacts with the slit. So robo slit interactions happening. And that interaction is very weak. But now the heparin sulfate, which is a negatively charged molecule, it comes and interacts with both robo and slate. And that forms a ternary complex, but that stabilizes the robo-slate interactions. By stabilizing, it's not just yeah, interaction that's happening, but in order for cells to repel each other, and there's a lot of things happening inside the cell, like cytoskeleton element, and that plays a role in making the cells to migrate. When cells migrating, and they don't have a legs, but they use the cytoskeletal elements to make them to go back and forth. They call kinesins and okay, other proteins are there. And there's uh, uh, proteins which plays a role in cell migrations. That's called cytoskeletal elements and so forth. What happens is that when the robust interactions happen, there's a signaling is happening inside. And that signaling that uh, just uh, goes into the cell, and that triggers the response for the cells to start migrating, and that's what is now they're going towards each other or going away from each other. So when the robust interaction is happening outside, the signaling occurs inside that affects the cytoskeleton elements and the motor proteins inside the cells. Rearrangement occurs, and thereby they know that they're in the right place or the wrong place. The wrong place, they start going in the specific directions. But they should also know which directions to go. If someone is coming with a gun to shoot you, and you don't want to walk towards that person, you want to walk away from that. You need a sense. The cells sense that kind of information when that interactions happen. That's what I mean. Repulsive means it's not the physical repulsion that's happening. So when the interaction happens, that is not the repulsive interaction. That's an attractive interaction between the robo and slate. That stabilizes the heparin sulfate, but the results in repelling the cells, not the repelling the robo and slate. The robo and slate are attracted and stabilized by the heparin sulfate, but that triggers the signaling, and the signaling results in making the cells to be closer and further apart. And even though I said the robo-slate okay, interactions are repulsive force and thereby cells will be uh, moving away from each other. And keep in mind, there are four different robos, okay, receptors. They're also splice variant. We don't understand still very much about it. For example, FGF receptor, there are only four receptors are there, FGF receptors. The splice variants, if you take them, we have 116 different FGF receptors. And we have, so far, we know 22 different FGFs. Likewise, in the slate, we have four different slates, okay? And they also say the five and six slates. And we have four different robo receptors that binds to the slate. And some of the robo slate interactions are repulsive for the cells and for actions to be repelling each other and blood vessels to repel from each other. And also, some robo slate interactions are attractive, depending on which robo receptor binding to the slate and which slate binds to which, okay, which, slate binds to which robo and that have both attractive, I didn't tell this very early because it's already very confusing. If I say that okay, it's attractive or repulsive, what are you talking about, okay? And this is exactly happening, okay? And so they're trying to figure out whether they, this is the right things to happen or not. There's so many different robots and their isoforms and the slate. And some of the interactions leads to cell attractions. Some of the interactions leads to cell repulsion. So this attraction repulsion is the physical repulsion attraction that is because of or the robo slit interactions that's different from attractions and repulsions, okay? Is that clear, Mawson? Anything else? 
Okay. So, now we have the blood vessels. Some of the vessels, you know, is micro vessels. Some of them are micro vessels. Some of them have, you know, only the short distance they will be traveling and okay, invading to the, uh, the tissue cells. Some of them go for long distance. So, so you have longer vessels and thicker vessels and okay, thinner vessels and how the endothelial cells would know how long they can just proliferate and how thick the vessels should be. So when the cells, endothelial cells, are already differentiated and now they're proliferating in response to VEGF and the VEGF binds to VEGF receptor and that interaction is again stabilized by heparin sulfate. Without heparin sulfate you don't have a very stable VEGF, VEGF receptor interactions. So when now this VEGF signaling occurs, cells are proliferating. You don't want the cells to proliferate randomly everywhere. You want them to have some directions and to proliferate. So now you have this blood vessel. This is a long axis. It's already formed the blood vessels, okay? It's a long axis. What happens that, so cells can proliferate with respect to this long axis in parallel direction, or they can go in a perpendicular direction. When the cells are proliferating perpendicular to the long axis, it elongates the blood vessels. When the cells proliferating parallel to the long axis, it gets thicker, larger vessels are made, and that's how the arteries are made. And it's triggered by the VEGF. So VEGF, we all know, it proliferates cell. But it's also found, VEGF not only triggers the proliferation, it also gives the direction of the proliferation what they call morphogenesis. And uh, so morphogen, you know that it gives a gradient and then gives a shape. But here you're giving a direction in which the cells to proliferate, thereby you can make the thicker vessels or longer vessels. And uh, so that requires a different kind of VEGF signaling. And we still don't understand how this happens. We only know that VEGF, okay, and it's important for the proliferation. We also now know that the VEGF is important for giving the direction in which cells propagate occurs. And we also know heparin sulfate is very important. And so that's where we stand right now. So this slide just talks about how the VEGF plays a role. So VEGF interacts with the VEGF receptors and then that results in not one signaling, it triggers multiple signalings with the ERK signaling, uh, okay, activation pathway it gives the proliferations and also it can trigger the AKT pathway that stimulates endo nitric oxide synthase, which gives a vasodilation, dilations, and also this VEGF receptor activation uh, can block the apoptosis. Apoptosis is a process by which cells undergo death. So you want, when the cells are proliferating, you don't want to have activated apoptosis pathway, then there is no productive okay, outcome outside. The cells are proliferating, cells are dying, which is not good. So when the cells are proliferating, you also want to inhibit apoptosis pathway, and that basically gives you the cell survival. And, we can, and also, like, you don't have proliferation happening all the time. But you want, once the blood vessels form, you want them to be stabilized, you want them to survive for a long time. Actually, endothelial cells, which are part of the blood vessels, they're known to live for longer, okay? And so that means they survive for a long time. So that means you need to continuously tell the cells not to die. The apoptosis pathway needs to be inhibited. For that, you need to have a VEGF receptor to be activated, and that's why normal cells always have the small amount of VEGF is continuously produced. They have a basal, not small level, I'll say. They have a specific amount of VEGF is secreted and expressed, and they interact continuously with the VEGF receptor, and thereby it gives a survival. Not necessarily you want to have a proliferation, but you want the cells to survive. And uh, so for that, you need to inhibit the apoptosis signaling pathway. And uh, so now let's look at the FGF. This is another whole story. We just talked about VEGF. And, FGF have so much role to play in all of this FGF interaction with the FGF receptors. Keep in mind, again, heparin sulfate is very, very important. And FGF have multiple roles to play in angiogenesis. One would be FGF, which triggers the protease productions the, by signaling. It can activate number of signaling pathways and hence the transcription and the results in translation of the proteases. And the proteases can degrade the basal, okay, extracellular matrix lamina uh, which is required when the cells are migrating and forming the tubes, you want to pave the way. And for that, you need to degrade the extracellular matrix. And so for that, you need to have proteases. When the cells, endothelial cells are proliferating, they also secrete a lot of proteases. So they can chew up the extracellular matrix, they can pave the pathway, they can start just moving along. 
so that protease production has been linked to the FGF signaling pathway, and also the cadherin we just talked about, adhesive protein, and whose expression, okay, is okay, upregulation, downregulation is linked to the FGF signaling, and thereby, when you have too much of cadherin, what happens is too sticky, which is not good when cells are migrating, you, do, you want to have some level of, okay, uh, interactions to be disturbed so that they're not too adhesive, so that it can facilitate migration. So FGF expression actually downregulates the cadherin, and thereby they're less sticky. Now they can migrate. When the cells are migrating and moving across, uh, you want to be okay, less adhesive, and that requires the less expression of cadherin. But once the proliferation is over, you want to be mature, mature, then you want to have more adhesive interaction then. Uh, FGF goes down, the cadherin goes up. When FGF goes down, cadherin goes up, then it gives a very sticky interactions, and thereby they stabilize this. Likewise, it also affects the integrin, which is another cell surface okay, molecule that plays a role in interaction, cell-cell interactions. And also, like a cadherin expression has to be uh, in a specific place. The cells have to be polarized, and also they should know the apical side, I means luminal side, or basolateral side, or like a uh, uh, obliminal side. And so that requires the redeploying the cadherin molecules. And again, FGF seems to be the signaling, not FGF by itself. The FGF triggers signaling, and uh, then reposition the cadherin molecule after cell polarizes. And this all happening in the late stage. Keep in mind, early stages, only thing that you have to keep in mind, the cells to proliferate and migrate. That's important for early stages. Late stages, which is a maturation stage, where the migration is less critical and proliferation is less critical, but you want to have a maturation. And there, that's where the cadherin's redeployment and then cap junction, which is very, again, critical, that gives the cell-cell interactions neighboring cells. And after that, you also want to recruit the matrix collagens and many different uh, extracellular matrix molecules that you need to sequester and then to give the okay, cell survival. And so matrix deposition happens. And also you need to recruit pericytes and also the smooth muscle cells and the wrap up around them. Again, all those things and which happen in the late stage and the FGF signaling is obviously plays a major role there. And when you have too much of proliferation, you can't expect the maturation. When the maturation is happening, you don't want to have proliferation and invasive stage, early stage is happening. So why is a continuous, okay? When the cells are proliferating at the end, and there the proliferation is happening, but the cells already proliferated here, they already reach the maturation. So the signals that's happening continuously in one place of the blood vessel, the maturation is happening. At the other end, there is still the proliferation happening, which is the early stages. So how are the cells are continuous on the FGF signal this happens? We know that the FGF signaling, the same FGF, can have different response based on its concentration. So the FGF can form the gradient. By forming the gradient FGF, and they have one role to play in the invasive stage, early stages, which is happening at the tip, and happening at the edge where the proliferation is happening, but it have a different amount of FGF by forming the gradient, and therefore it plays a different role and that causes the maturation. Keep in mind, the same FGF can have a different role based on its concentration, and this concentration or gradient formation, again, is influenced by heparin sulfate. So one molecule, we talked so many times about heparin sulfate. Just give me one example, could be, say. And so one molecule is a perlacan. And uh, so heparin sulfate pedoglycan, which is expressed both on the cell surface and also in the extracellular matrix, which has three heparin sulfate chains. And perlacan also is a very interesting molecule. And some of the fragments of the heparin, of the pedoglycan, the core protein, which doesn't have any heparin sulfate, the fragments have a direct role to play in okay, and genesis, which you'll see in a minute. So here, in endothelial cells, this perlacan core protein interacts with the FGF, FGF receptor that triggers the signaling, and thereby can affect the protease uh, productions, and it affects the proliferations and migrations, and direction in which they migrate, and so forth, and also other places, it gives you uh, other information that required for maturation process. And this is with respect to endothelial cells. Whereas the smooth muscle cells, which also produces perlacan, and also extracellular matrix have a perlacan, and they do also interact with the FGF. You don't want to have the same interaction that leads to the same effect. So in endothelial cells, FGF, FGF receptor interaction have one effect, whereas okay, the FGF interactions with the heparin sulfate chain of the perlacan, they have a different effect. And here they have no signaling to smooth muscle cells, because in smooth muscle cells, basically, they're recruited there, 
and to deface it and stabilize them. We don't want them to proliferate. If they proliferate, what happens? It can cause a number of other vessel problems. And one case, we know that when the stent, when people have the stent, when they have a cardiac problems and heart attack, they have a stent okay, inserted in the body. What happens there, there is so much of smooth muscle cells proliferate, and they call, I think, instant restenosis. I think they call restenosis. That basically, the smooth muscle cells are recruited to proliferating themselves so massively. So basically, when you have endothelial cells, and they have opposing roles to play, they proliferate themselves and stabilize us, but it prevents the smooth muscles from proliferating. But it recruits the smooth muscle cells, but it doesn't let it proliferate. So there's a fine balance. So the same perla can have a different roles to play in one cell, depending on the cell type, endothelial versus uh, uh, the smooth muscle cells. But once you put the stent, you lose that ability to control the smooth muscle cell behavior, the proliferate, that causes restenosis. That's why they have to go back to the hospital again. They have to go for again, then putting the new stent again. I think once people, I, whenever I hear, I study this and talk to the doctor, I get scared. Man, how many times you go and poke your body and keep putting the stent? But once you get used to it, the doctor said that the doctors get used to, and then patients get used to. Okay, it's still so crazy. Okay, and uh, but this is uh, okay, this is a problem that where heparin sulfate has been shown to play a major role, opposing roles with endothelial cells. In one place it triggers the signaling, other place doesn't trigger trigger the signaling. So besides the FGFs, there are also numerous other growth factors uh, okay, which are listed here, and they interact with the intergrains and so forth, and they have different roles to play, which I don't have a time, but please know that these growth factors and intergrains, different okay, things, are also interact uh, with the heparin sulfate, and they, those interactions result in affecting various aspects of the angiogenesis, for which we still don't have much knowledge, but those interactions are very important, so that prevents uh, the leakiness of the blood vessels, otherwise the cells become very leaky. So there's also a huge connection between coagulation and angiogenesis. And uh, so in, in, in particular in cancers, okay, the oncogenes are turned on. Oncogenes are the genes which now they, okay, causes transform the cells to become tumorous, okay? It cancerous as oncogenes. And also your tumor suppressor genes are now turned off or like less expressed. And also since, by definition now, your, uh, the cells are now transformed, they're growing in a controlled manner, so they need more oxygen, more nutrients, now they're under hypoxic state. So under these conditions, what happens, that the VEGF start turned on, the VEGF release takes place. So when the VEGF is released excessively, what happens that now they start the early stages of proliferations, that means it's immature stage, that means that blood vessels are not very stable, they're very leaky, and so that means they, they can permeate things, molecules, the vascular permeability is, okay, is dramatically increased. Under those conditions also you have a TC factor, which is, you all know, some of you know very well, which is involved in coagulation pathway, and that TC factor is expressed now. This TC factor now controls the factor seven, factor 10, and factor two, and so now it controls the coagulation. And these molecules also now affects the of expression. So now this cycle is turned on. Now the VEGF is overexpressed in response to this. And overexpressed in the VEGF now uh, the vascular permeation, which is basically says that the vessels are immature stage. So now there's a constant talk which is going on with coagulation factors, with angiogenesis factors, and through this vicious pathway that is happening in the cancer, unfortunately. That means that blood vessels in the cancer okay, stage, the, the blood vessels are not very matured. They're immature. Uh, which is advantageous when you go for chemotherapy, which we we'll talk about this later. So this slide talks about, you all know very well, about uh, hemostatic systems, very intensive pathway, extensive pathway. You all probably know more than I do. It's Dr. Desai's group know everything this, and uh, I still have to memorize. So, but what is very important is that there's a number of factors involved in the coagulation pathway. They control angiosis, and uh, one is the pre calicrane when it's broken down into calicrane, it gives a small fragment. And the small fragment is anti-angenic. And also antithrombin, it binds to thrombin, right? The prothrombin becomes a thrombin with the help of factor 10A. And the prothrombin becomes a thrombin. Two things happen. The prothrombin becomes thrombin. The small fragments in the prothrombin gets released. The they call fragments one and two, F1 and F2. And those fragments, don't think they have no role. They have no role in coagulation, but they have a huge role in angiogenesis. They actually have a strong anti-angenic effects they have. And also, 
when the prothrombin becomes a thrombin, the thrombin you all know interacts with antithrombin, which is serine protease inhibitors. So, and this interaction between antithrombin and the okay, with with the heparin sulfate, they forms a link. And then what happens that this antithrombin conformation changes. This is called activated stage, and then they have no role to play for coagulation once it's activated stage. But this activated antithrombin is highly antiangiogenic. Okay, not the antithrombin, okay, but activated antithrombin is highly antiangiogenic because, as you know, that antithrombin conformation changes, and this changed conformation of antithrombin have a highly antigenic activity. And also, this, there are so many other proteins involved in fibrinolysis, which is totally different. You have plasminogen, this is plasminogen activated comes, and then it cleaves them into plasmin. It gives you small fragments, and these fragments, okay, uh, this plasmin then it gives you angiostatin, and also there's other things that involve, I think the next slide you will see that, which also, so there's some factors involved in coagulation, regulates angiogenesis, and also the factor that comes from the fibrinolysis also regulates uh, angiogenesis. So before we move on to look at this on TC factor, okay, what it does exactly is that the TC factor, okay, when the wild type, okay, mice, when they have a TC factor expressed, you have endothelial cells, you have pericytes, and you also have smooth muscle cells. So now they have a nice, strong vessels formation, there's no leakiness. But when you knock out the TC factor, in, at least in most models, what they've shown that, and now the endothelial cells lost their ability to recruit the pericytes and the smooth muscle cells. And therefore, what happens, the vessels, the vessels become very leaky, and it leads to the bleeding. So the TC factor on one side okay, it plays a role in coagulation, and also it makes the blood vessels are not strong anymore and it affects, so that's how the TC factor role is shown. So this slide talks about the thromine and multiple roles of thromine that it plays here. We talked about this prothromine becomes a thromine. It gives you two fragments. They call fragment one and fragment two. And both fragment two and fragment one and two together plays a role in angiogenesis. It actually inhibits angiogenesis. And also an antithromine is activated form antithromine three it inhibits angiogenesis, whereas the thrombin also by itself actually promotes the angiogenesis. By how? So the thrombin uh, okay, increases the VEGF okay, receptor expression, not the VEGF, but the VEGF receptor expression, because each VEGF that you express, you need to have a receptor. Without a receptor, you don't have any role. And so here, the thrombin increases the VEGF receptor expression on the endothelial cells, and thereby it can trigger the VEGF signaling. And as you know, as VEGF activation take place the signaling pathway, the endothelial cells are more permeable, okay? It triggers the permeability, that means that now become more angenic, and also thromin, okay, affects the way the FGF is released, the FGF, the basic FGF in particular is required, okay, from the endothelial like, extracellular matrix and from endothelial cells, and because FGF itself have a signaling pathway, and that's affected by having the thromin. the thromin actually triggers the release of basic FGF, from extracellular matrix and from endothelial cells, and thereby you can trigger the endothelial cell proliferation. And also thromin, as, what is thromin? It's a serine protease, right? That's why we have a serine protease inhibitor, serpine, which is under thromin-3. So it's a protease, basically thromin is a protease. So that can cleave up a number of different pro-proteinases, uh, uh, pro and thereby can make the proteases which are inactive, now it releases by cleaving the pro, converting the proprotease into protease, they become active. By making them active, now it can trigger a number of extracellular matrix degradations and basement membrane degradations and so forth. And one example is that the thrombin, which converts a pro MMP2, is a matrix metalloprotease 2, which is an inactive form. Now it becomes the MMP2. Now the MMP2 now can clear the extracellular matrix. And also TC plasminogen activator and the PA1 which is released from endothelial cells, which is regulated by thromine, and which leads to the BM, uh, which is basement membrane, and ECM, which stands for extracellular matrix degradation. And because basement membrane or extracellular matrix degradation is required for the proliferating cells to find the path, and without that, you don't have angiogenesis. So the thromine, uh, fragments have opposing role, like it inhibits angiogenesis, but thromine itself promotes angiogenesis, and see that? It's the yin and yang of the story. So one promotes this fragment, promotes it, inhibits it, by itself it promotes it, and by through different pathways. So there's a strong connection between thromin, which is a part of the coagulation system, into angiogenesis. There's a connection between also with uh, uh, the fibrinolysis system, which is coming here. So 
you know, the PLG, the plasmolytic gen, becomes a plasmin, which is catalyzed by tissue plasmogen activator, and the fragment of that is become an angiostatin, and the PLG is broken down into plasmin, and the small fragment is called angiostatin, and because this is basically have an anti-angionic effect, it inhibits angiogenesis. Whereas the plasmin itself is promotes angiogenesis, but the fragment that comes from the PLG is precursor molecule and is angiostatic and is, is produced angiostatic. And also, the plasmin, okay, this itself then activates and releases the VEGF and basic FGF and hepatocyte growth factors and TGF beta. And we know that VEGF and FGF and HGF, at least, they interact with the heparin sulfate. And therefore, that triggers the angiogenesis, whereas TGF beta, which is not known to interact with the heparin sulfate, but they have independent pathway by which they can also activate angiogenesis. So the plasmin can activate angiogenesis, which is in the fibrinolytic system. And but it's a fragment which the, of the its precursors, which is angiostatic, okay, by releasing angiostatin molecule. So now we have a fibrinolytic system, which can also control angiogenesis depending on the fragments, or by itself, or the coagulation pathway. They can control angiogenesis. So this talks about the slide about angiostatin production. You have a plasminogen, and this plasmin activator comes and cleaves it and make the plasmin and the small. And the plasmin is, okay, again, is converted back into two different molecules called angiostatin-1 and angiostatin-2. And this one is about how endostatin is produced. So you have a collagen, right? You have a collagen. This molecule is collagen. And what happened, that matrix metalloproteus comes in and is, of course, metal-dependent one. It cleaves them all into various fragments and it releases this molecule, which is basically endostatin precursor fragments. And then what happened that this is further cleaved, okay, or, or pruned, or tuned, okay, or trimmed further by uh, the call elastasis and cathepsin L. And then this black one comes off, and now it releases the 20 kilo Dalton fragments, and this is nothing but endostatin. So endostatin is coming from the collagen, okay? The collagen which is part of the extracellular matrix, but once it's broken down, it now have a different role. And okay, it's, it's endostatin, so it's basically it's anti-angiogenic. And this endostatin interacts with the heparin sulfate. Interaction of endostatin with the heparin sulfate is really, really, really important. And that regulates angiogenesis. And so this slide talks about various fragments that's coming, okay, fragments of the coagulation pathway, fibrinolytic pathway, and the involved, and how it affects angiogenesis. For example, angiostatin, by interacting with alpha phi beta 3, and it inhibits the alpha phi beta 3 uh, okay, signaling pathway, which is important for cell migration. And also angiostatin blocks the ATP synthase. ATP synthase is required to make ATP. Because when cells are proliferating, they're migrating, they need energy. So to spend the energy, so they need to make energy. So it means basically they have to make ATP. So this molecule angiostatin somehow inhibits the, the signaling pathway that leads to the ATP synthase production. By blocking ATP synthase, now we don't have enough ATP produced. Therefore, we can trigger angiogenesis. And that's how the angiostatin plays a role. And so also endostatin, which is directly interacts with the heparin sulfate, and heparin sulfate interacts with the FGF, and interaction of H, uh, HSPG with FGF is required for proliferation and migration and so forth, that record for angiogenesis. But what happened now, that endostatin is competing with the basic FGF for the binding sites on the heparin sulfate, and if the FGF binds, it can trigger angiogenesis. But endostatin binds and throws the FGF out, now what happens? Now there is no angiogenesis. So there's a competition between FGF and endostatin. And if the endostatin wins, or if endostatin finds a pathway to bind and to the structure, and then FGF is rejected or ejected, then what happens is that it blocks angiogenesis. But now if FGF is winning, what happens? Now we trigger angiogenesis. So what controls is controlled by two things. One would be the structure of heparin sulfate to some extent. Of course, they're both competing for the same site. Then it doesn't make many sense, the structure, because structure is the same structure they're competing for both. So what controls is the levels of endostatin, which is FGF. So in the proliferating phase, in the angionic stage, you have more FGF, but you want to have angiostatic, you have more endostatin, the more endostatin, then more endostatin binding to the heparin sulfate, and that means FGF is not able to bind, and thereby now it has an anti-angionic effect. Of course, it's not just only one thing endostatin does. It also have heparin sulfate independent pathway, thereby it can inhibit, and uh, which are listed here. And the same thing is going on with the uh, uh, 
tissue, okay, inhibitor okay, matrix metalloproteases, and PF4, which is another example. The PF4, platelet factor 4, which is released by the platelets, which binds to heparin sulfate. So heparin sulfate is known to bind to basic FGF and VEGF. What happened now, the PF4 is competing with basic FGF4 and VEGF. But FGF and VEGF interaction with the heparin sulfate is required for angiogenesis. Now, the PF4 is competing. As a result, what happens is that now the PF4 is actually anti-angenic. So platelet factor 4, which is released by the platelets, have an anti-angenic effect by binding to the HSPG and thereby preventing the HSPG or heparin sulfate to binding to the okay, VEGF and the basic FGF. And uh, they, of course, they have other roles as well, the PF4. It also okay, affects the pro-angenic factors uh, uh, by not just, com I think it's most likely through HSPG pathway. And also PF4 seems to be affecting through chemokine interactions uh, with these receptors because PF4 is basically another chemokine. There's so many different chemokines. I'm sure Krishna's group knows everything about it. And uh, so it interacts with a specific receptor and this receptor uh, activation pathway is linked to cell cycle and thereby it arrests the cell cycle, PF4 arrests the cell cycle and uh, by binding to the receptor. And therefore, it's just not the only one pathway. Each other molecule have more than one pathway which is affecting some of the pathways. HSPG is directly plays a role. In some, it has indirect role to play. Yes, awesome. So all these ligands um, compete for one receptor? So the question is, is all of these ligands competing for one receptor? As you can see, they have multiple functions. It's likely it's going to bind to the multiple different things. In some places, they're competing for the same site on the heparin sulfate. And also, there are HSPG independent pathways they bind to the different receptors, and also they can bind to the same receptor, but keep in mind the receptors have multiple isoforms. Depending on which receptor isoform they can bind, they have a different signaling. And depending on which signaling pathway you turn on, and that have a different effect. So it looks very complicated now. Of course it's complicated. <laughs> now it looks like it is complicated. <laughs> it's, it's because um, now what this, if, you know, even one thing fails, then we are so if I look at this, we are so vulnerable that if one thing fails, then it's cancer. Game over, right? <laughs> so now, what controls the? My question is like, what is the limiting step? Like, there must be one controlling step, which, like, origin. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So the question is, as you said, so it's a tipping point. Okay, the only one thing that can go wrong, we're done. We're screwed. Okay. But luckily, we are so much evolved, and. We don't understand ourselves so much. That's why we are here we're in the school, educating ourselves. And there are more than one pathway. If we are evolved to come this far, relying on a single pathway, we are doomed like millions of years ago. Okay? And there are more than one pathway exists in nature. It seems like it duplicates it. And by having duplicacy, one pathway screws up, other pathways can still rescue. That's why when you do gene knockout, sometimes you don't have an obvious phenotype, then isoforms. And isoform have no role to play, but when the major form is gone, the minor isoforms now play a compensatory role. So luckily, this is a cyclic pathway. In the disease, is a vicious cycle. In the normal physiology, which is a very good cycle to have, because by having parallel pathways, and so it's a selection process the nature selects that to make sure that we are taken care. If something goes wrong, everything else is turned on. There's a danger signal turned on. So they're trying to compensate. If that also cannot rescue, then you're doomed. Okay? But to get to that stage is very hard. That's why not everyone develops cancer. Not everyone gets a cancer very early on. And there's age dependencies, there's genetic factors, there's environmental factors, our habit, our food, and our lifestyle is just not the one factor. There's multiple things that leads to the cancer disease stage. Like that, there's a multiple factors. So angiostatin and endostatin both have a common role, which is to block angiogenesis, but they do differently. That again gives an example. So one goes wrong because angiostatin coming from one place, okay, plasminogen, whereas endostatin is coming from collagen, which is different. So the origin of angiostatin and endostatin, as I just said in the previous slide, they're different. Some different precursors molecule you get, okay. So one coming from fibrinolytic systems, one is coming from coagulation system. So the the protein of origin for this are very different. And the PF4 is coming from platelets, whereas this is coming from collagens, and this is coming from uh, uh, this one, other one, I talked about it. 
So, so each one is coming from different proteins, from different cell types, and that's how it affects. And therefore, the mechanisms evolved to make sure that there's a parallel pathway exists to regulate and control, but they still try to fight very hard uh, to have a normal pathway. And, uh, but when things fail, it, that's not because of one pathway, it's more than one, and that results in what okay, it leads to. Don't get scared, okay? <laughs> There's more than one path that exists for us. And so this slide, okay, as you're talking about, uh, it gives you the origin of various things, okay? They're not only coming from indoor, okay? For example, endostatin is coming from collagen, and this collagen is basically part of the basement membrane, which is not part of any cells. It's coming from basement membrane, and of course, which is made by endothelial cells, and also made by the pericytes, made by the smooth muscle cells. It's not controlled by the one cell type the basement membrane, and thereby the endostatin production from the collagen, okay, that comes totally from uh, the cell type independent, but it's coming from the extracellular matrix. And we haven't talked about endorepilin, which is another angiostatic molecule, which is coming from the proteoglycan, perlacan, which we talked about perlacan, opposing roles in endothelial cells versus the smooth muscle cells. But when the perlacan is broken down, it gives a small fragment, and the small fragment is angiostatic, means it prevents angiogenesis, is endorepilin. Whereas the perlacan itself promotes angiogenesis, but it's a fragment, endorepilin, it inhibits angiogenesis. Like the endostatin here, another molecule, the small fragments, which okay, inhibits angiogenesis. And angiostatin, which is coming from plasminogen, which, then we talked about that, like angiostatin coming from plasminogen, which is coming originally, actually, from endothelial cells. And also, we have other things that we don't have time to talk about, and uh, thrombospondin 1 and thrombospondin 2, and also tissue inhibitor matrix metalloproteases and proteases. And these proteases uh, and basically can cleave the plasminogen into angiostatin, okay, that's of endothelial origin, and also proteases can cleave the collagen to get endostatin, which is of basal membrane origin, and protease can also cleave the perlacan uh, into endorepilin, which is angiostatic, which is coming from basal membrane. And also, you have the proteases secreted by the pericytes, which can also can cleave the plasminogens and collagens and perlacans. And also, the tumor cells also secrete the proteases. And those proteases secreted by tumor cells can also release angiostatin, endostatin, and endorepilin. And they're all angiostatic, but they also have the other fragment, which is angiogenic. So now, there's always a constant fight between angiogenic factors and antiangiogenic factors. In normal physiological condition, and we, an angiostatic is permitted, okay? But when there's a wound, there's a healing process, we trigger the angiogenesis. And when there is a need for the blood vessels formation to happen, then that we trigger that angiogenesis, okay? And the tumor suppression happens, but what happens that angiogenesis factors now overtake the tumor growth because the tumors, as they constantly grow, they're under hypoxic conditions. Now, none of these things matters because even the tumor cells produce proteases, and this proteases now produces angiostatic molecule like endorepilin, endostatin, angiostatin. Still, the tumor cells make angiogenesis. How this happens? Because under hypoxic conditions, endothelial cells produce VEGF continuously under hypoxic conditions. So now you make so much VEGF they're normally supposed to make. You make, you make so much of VEGF, now the VEGF triggers endothelial cell proliferation, and then that takes over completely different pathway. So there's always a, a angiostatic and pro-angiogenic and anti-angiogenic mechanism in place. Even though the tumor cells secrete the proteases that triggers the production of anti-angiogenic molecules, still that triggers angiogenesis through different pathways is totally because of VEGF release, continuous VEGF activation pathway because of under hypoxic conditions, which is overtakes this, all these molecules together. And also platelets, which is totally different okay, cells, and the circulating cells that's coming from hematopoietic stem cells, what happens that that gives you PF4 and TSP1, which also affects, okay, which is angiostatic, basically the PF4 competing with the FGF and the VEGF for the heparin sulfate chains, it affects the VEGF functions and also it affects the FGF functions. So there's a complex pathway that involved that constantly regulates, but still the tumor wins over okay, the normal physiological outcome by triggering neoangiogenesis because under hypoxic conditions, what happens that is induces hypoxic inducible factor, which then triggers the VEGF, and it makes way so much VEGF, 
and therefore it activates the VEGF receptor that takes us back into the preliminary stage of the uh, uh, reactive phase where like the proliferation is happening and immature, that's why it forms immature blood vessels. That's why in the new blood vessels found with the tumor cells are often very leaky, and uh, so which is not good, but still is good enough for them to just recruit the nutrients, to get the nutrients they wanted. And uh, so they are not very stable, okay, the tumor, new, okay, tumor vessels as strong and matured as the adult vascular that we have. So this slide talks about all different angiogenic factors and antigenic factors, how they are interacting with proteoglycans. And uh, there's so many of those, okay? And what is the time now we have? Can you tell me? 9.53, oh, I have seven more minutes to go. So I can still talk, okay? And uh, so there's so many things out there, and for some of which we know, or the specificity for some of which there is no specificity exist, okay? And, uh, but that's how the nature is designed, and, uh, but still, okay, and it controls, okay, but it's binding to both angenic and antigenic factors. So let's move on to look at other aspects of that. In tumors, there's an enzyme called heparinase is secreted by tumor cells. So heparinase is an enzyme which cleaves the heparin sulfate into smaller oligos, the polysaccharide and the oligosaccharide. And uh, so this enzyme is supposed to be in the lysosome. So when the cell surface proteoglycan finish their job, they have a half-life, two, three, four hours, and then they recycle back into lysosomes, lysosomes are chopped off into small fragments by heparinase, and then the endosulfatases and uh, sorry, exosulfatases can act upon them and remove all the sulfates and remove, okay, then make the building blocks again, the sulfate and glucosamine, glucuronic acid and whatnot, okay, or galactosamine. And so the heparinase, which is lysosomal specific, which gets into lysosome, which is supposed to cleave the heparin sulfate into smaller fragments in the lysosomes. But in the tumor, tumors, for whatever the reasons, the tumors are growing fast, the tumor's membranes are very leaky, and so is the ind individual uh, what do you call organelles, okay, including lysosomes, they're very leaky, they're not made properly, okay, and uh, they behave more like a stem cells, they're very leaky, what happens is that now they trigger a lot of things, they release, keep releasing it, okay, the tumor cells, and one of the things they release, it's supposed to now they release, it's supposed to go into lysosome, which is a heparinase, so heparinase now released into extracellular matrix, it's supposed to go to lysosome, and this heparinase once it's released into extracellular matrix, Outside the cell, what happens? You're seeing the heparin sulfate everywhere, mama mia. So they're supposed to be working in the lysosome. Now they're outside, and now this, they can see heparin sulfate everywhere. They start chewing the heparin sulfate everywhere. This heparin sulfate interacts with the chemokines and interacts with the growth of FGFs, VEGFs, and also interacts with the VEGF receptors, robo slate, and whatnot. But now, what happens is that this heparin sulfate, which controls the matrix, which controls the proteases, and protease inhibitors, there's a fine balance between protease and protease inhibitors. That's how we control the coagulation cascade. And likewise, you have a proteases, protease inhibitors, and extracellular matrix, which constantly undergo remodeling, so everything is fine. With the help of heparin sulfate, you can control it. But now, this heparinase enzyme, supposed to lysosome, is coming outside. It starts chewing the heparin sulfate everywhere. What happens? Now they're fragmented, and now they release the basic FGFs that triggers the angiogenesis, and also the now heparin sulfate cannot do the role that's supposed to do. What happens that it triggers cell proliferation, cell migrations, and also the protease inhibitors and the proteases which are sequestered and kept in inactive state. Now they're all released. Now there's no control, there's no policing anymore. What happens? Now the gundas takes over, and that's what happens in the cancers. And the heparin sulfate plays a policing role of controlling everything, proteases, Protease inhibitors, VEGF, FGF, you just name them, okay? But now, there is no more sequestration, okay? And, okay, okay, keeping them in intact in order. Now, they're all gone out of control. The out of control, this is what happens to the tumor, okay? It's not just with the angiostatin and angiogenic and proangenic factors, and also extracellular matrix with the proteases and protease inhibitors. They also control. And of course, we are here to understand more about the roles of GAGs and glycans. That's why I'm talking from the standpoint of glycans and, glycans and GAGs. If you go to the, some of the labs, which are specialized in proteases, they can talk about proteases' role without talking about glycans and glycans. And, but they all at the end, together, plays a role. That's why things don't go wrong most of the time. 
So this slide talks about syndicant 1, the role in the tumor growth, and syndicant 1, as we said, is a protoglycan, and it plays a role in okay, cell growth. And, uh, okay, and also, what happens is that this protoglycan and it's here, which interacts with the collagen, it interacts with the receptor, thereby affects the cell signaling pathway. What happens now is that, uh, including the integrins, and now the heparin sulfate is chewed off in tumor cells by heparinase enzyme, and there is no more heparin sulfate attached to the core protein. And also, core proteins can be easily cleavable by matrix metalloproteases, and also by other proteases. Now, what happened that now the protoglycan lost its control of everything, and now that you have this integrin-like molecules, which are supposed to be adhesive by interacting with the other glycans and other receptors and other proteins, and thereby keeping the cells intact. Now, the gags are gone, integrins go wild, and they don't know whom to they talk to and interact, and they are gone as well. They're not able to control any more cell behavior, which is cell migrations. Normal cells don't migrate. Okay, of course, the, uh, the T cells, B cells, the, uh, the blood cells migrate, but the normal other cells they don't migrate, epithelial cells don't migrate. But now what happens is that now they start migrating, and because of this adhesive proteins no longer can talk to each other, and the collagens are gone, and the heparin sulfate are gone, and also what happens is fragments can trigger the angiogenesis, and also they can you know, trigger the sprouting and so forth. There's just not one thing, but they do many different things, and this is what happens to syndicants. So this slide talks about various roles, about perlacans and agrins and collagens, and how it plays a role in tumorogenesis and angiogenesis, and also how the play a molecule like perlacan and glyphicans can interact with the okay, molecules such as endostatin. Endostatin not only interacts with the glyphicans, it also interacts with the VEGF receptors, it also interacts with the integrins, and thereby it plays a specific role, and that eventually leads to inhibition of angiogenesis, but now the things go wrong, they can trigger the cell proliferations and angiogenesis happening and by making the, not the glypican, but the perlacan to control directly. So this one talks about diabetic state. In the normal state, so you have endothelial cells, you have pericytes, and you have also uh, uh, the smooth muscle cells, the results in forming the basement membrane, uh, uh, that membrane composed of extracellular matrix, basically. What happens is that the normal state, they're very thick, okay? Uh, very thin, but very dense, and they have a lot of extracellular uh, perlacans, particularly perlacan. And so what happened now that in diabetic state, what happened that the perlacan level goes down, they have less glycans, and the, the now they're more diffused, and they expanded the basement membrane uh, with the less uh, perlacan. Uh, as a result of that, now they are becoming, have more porosity, and because of more porosity, now what happens that porous, okay, the more porous, and now the protein, they're supposed to be get, okay, taken back. Now they are not taken back. Now the protein is going through the glomerular filtrations, basically. That's why diabetic people, and they have, because of decreased perlacan synthesis and also expands now the basement membrane, what happens is that now they have increases porosity that results in albumin, which is one of the major proteins that we have in the blood, which is required. And now they get lost. And also not only albumin you lose, you also lose many different proteins which are supposed to get not lost. And that results in proteinuria and that leads to diabetic state in, in which the endothelial cells are compromised. And this slide talks about, uh, we just talked about this endostatin, which comes from this collagens, okay? And this okay, endostatin now interacts with the VEGF receptors, is also interacts with the heparin uh, uh, okay, molecules. And what happens is that uh, this endostatin now converts the okay, proactive form into the MMP, which is inhibited, and thereby the matrix metal protein, which is required for uh, angiogenesis, now is inhibited. Uh, by from preventing the conversion of pro-MMP into active MMP, and also that now endostatin interacting with the alpha for beta one integrin receptors, which thereby also controls the cell motility and means cell uh, migrations, and also the endostatin uh, uh, inter okay, interacts with the VEGF receptor and competing with the VEGF and thereby throwing the VEGF out, it prevents the proliferations in all of these places. Heparin sulfate plays a major role by stabilizing endostatin as well. So obvious. By looking at the, our slides and talk and discussion, we think VEGF is an obvious target, which is that, so we know that VEGF plays a role, so immediately one can think of, why don't you just black VEGF, okay? By using antibodies against VEGF and interact with the VEGF pathways, but it works, it blocks angiogenesis for sure, but it has a numerous side effects, and since we don't have much time to go through, uh, keep in mind that by blocking the VEGF, okay, you affect the endothelial cell functions, because VEGF is required for the endothelial cell functions. 
And by blocking uh, the VEGF uh, to play exercises role through endothelial cell functions, it leads to the bleeding and thrombotic events. It causes the hypertension. It, it affects the photocytes, and therefore it affects, uh, leads to the protein loss and proteinuria. And it also causes hypothyroidism. And so it has numerous side effects. But bottom line is that it works. Okay, it blocks on genesis, but it comes with an effect, a lot of side effects. So let's now look at a couple of other places where, okay, like not just in cancer, and other places also on genesis is not, okay, wanted, okay, it's unwarranted, and it's not, okay, good, okay. One is called uh, ROP pathogenesis. This is basically, some of you might know as a doctor, and uh, is that uh, when yeah, baby is born prematurely, the infant, what they do? They put them in an incubator. They apply light, you know, light box. They also put a lot of oxygen, okay, it means heavy oxygen, so that uh, the baby, uh, the newborn, okay, infant can breathe, okay, and because they need more oxygen because their vasculature is not well developed, the lung is not fully developed, and they, but they need to get more oxygen. Normal breathing is not going to help you to get enough oxygen into everywhere. And it's a free, okay, free term infant, like two months, one month, depending on more. Uh, okay, early, that's more the danger. Okay, so basically, you put them under okay, a chamber with a light on one side, a lot of oxygen on the side. But it does a lot of damages. One is, which I'm not going to talk about it, but you should know that it affects the lung morphology forever. If you image the lung blood vessels of the preterm infant exposed to a lot of oxygen, which is a normal term infant, their lung vasculature is totally different. And uh, so that may explain why the people who are preterm born, okay, exposed to the oxygen chamber and light, okay, not the light so much, but high oxygen pressure, the very early in life, okay, and they have the lifetime of uh, expectancy about 63 and 64, whereas a normal infant, okay, goes 73 and 74, there's a 10 years gap. Not that everyone is born preterm, they're gonna die very early, but it's the statistically significant. And their lung morphology is different. They always have the problems later on in their life, like mid 50s until their death, some kind of, not all of them, but many of them having the problem with the breathing and so forth is because of the lung architecture is different and the vascular system is different there with the pre, okay. And another one that I just recently found as I was putting the slides together is that in eyes, retina, and what happens is that when you put them under high pressure, it's called uh, uh, retina uh, of, okay, of the preterm infant pathogenesis. That's what ROP stands for. Uh, retinal toxicity of uh, preterm ROP. And what happens is that this normal retina is here, and the blood vessels are like protruding in the, okay, inside. And here's a corona, it's a lens, all those things, you know, it's a retina. But it just doesn't get to the lens. If it gets to the lens, the blood vessels, then you start losing your reason, okay? That happens as we get older. That's what they call macular degenerations. The blood vessels are drawn more towards, and you try to block that, okay? But now as a preterm infant, and uh, now by having exposed to the high oxygen levels, what happens that now uh, these capillaries, and under hyperoxy condition, not hypoxia, under hyperoxy conditions. So what happens that under hyperoxy conditions, VEGF level goes down. You know the VEGF is important, uh, for the vasculature and the, so that the basal levels, and also and tumor, hypoxic happens because cells migrating faster, dividing faster, they need more oxygen, so they felt like they're in hypoxic conditions. So the hypoxia triggers a VEGF production. But now you expose them to the hyperoxic conditions, it's opposite of hypoxia. So hypoxic. So what happens? Obviously, in hypoxia, VEGF goes up. In hyperoxic condition, VEGF goes down. When VEGF goes down so much down, what happens that? all these blood vessels. Remember, this is the micro vessels, not like a capillary that you have in the heart that's taking everywhere. It's the micro vessels. They have a propensity to undergo damage so quickly, the VEGF goes down. So much that the blood vessels are gone so instantaneously, okay? And of course, you don't put the infant, the preterm infant, all the time in oxygen chamber. Then eventually take them out after a week or two. And now what happens is that now we have a high pressure oxygen, you put them, now, you all of a sudden, you put them in normal breathing condition with the regular atmospheric pressure. Now, the cells think that they're, now they're in hypoxic conditions. So now they're hypoxic, and they, even though it's not hypoxic, it's normal cells, but now normal cells expose so much to the oxygen. Now, they're exposed to the normal atmospheric pressure. Now, they think that is a hypoxic. The cells think it's hypoxic. So what happens that 
Now, VEGF shoots up again. As you know, the VEGF increases much more than normal level, then it triggers angiogenesis. Now, what's happening is that now the blood vessels are proceeding in all directions, okay, and then uh, that results in forming the new vessels, and that actually leads to the blindness. There's a macular degeneration is happening now in the preterm infant exposure to high pressure, and then the low oxygen, hypoxia, even though it's a normal oxygen level, it thinks it's hypoxic conditions, which have increased new vessels, and that leads to the blindness, which is not good. It causes retinopathy. So what they found that there's a molecule called PIGF, it's placental growth factor, which also competes for the VEGF receptor. There's a two different receptors out there, like VEGF receptor one and two. It seems like VEGF receptor one is more critical okay, here in retina. And then uh, the pl placental growth factor one, if you give the placental growth factor one, that binds to VEGF receptor, and which prevents the increase to VEGF that from binding to the VEGF receptor, and thereby it can prevent the new vessels formation. Because keep in mind, so VEGF levels also is very critical. Now, by having the PIGF1, of binding to VEGF receptor 1, which prevents the increased amount of VEGF under hypoxic, even though it's not a hypoxia, but that's what the cell thinks. And then now, okay, now it prevents a new blood vessel formation. So now this is getting probably into the clinical trials very soon. And, but please note that the preterm infant, when expose them oxygen, of course, you rescue them uh, from death, but it have huge consequence to the vasculature by exposing hyperoxia and hypoxia conditions. Okay, this again talks about uh, the molecular mechanism behind VEGF and how this happens. Okay, another place I'm gonna talk about the blood vessels is the hypertension. And uh, uh, so you know hypertension is people have a high blood pressure and so forth. And so it's important to treat people with high blood pressure because if you don't treat them very early on, and so it affects the vasculature permanently and it has huge consequences. And so the mouse models, it has been shown that when it's called spontaneous hypertensive responsive mouse, it's called SHR. SHR stands for spontaneous hypertensive responsive one. And when they're looking at the vascular network, compared to the wild type, what they call WKY, comparable genetic background mouse. And you can see there's a lot of branching of the blood vessels and network, okay, and the network is there nicely. But in the, uh, in the spontaneous hypertension responsive mouse, what happens is that you know, a lot of small vessels are gone, lost completely. And in some networks, you can see that only the major vessels are there, and the minor, okay, small okay, branching is all gone. And this is with the small networks, because the, the blood vessels have macro networks, micro networks, and different organs, different places. But it also found that in some other networks, in hypertensive uh, responsive mice, and what happened that uh, when they have a major network, they have more branching than uh, the corresponding the wild type. So in the small networks, they have lost their branchings, and they can see more increased branching in the wild type. But is opposite in another vasculature, okay, and other systems in the same mouse, okay, they have more branching. So basically what happened, where you're supposed to have a more branching, have a less branching, where you have a less branching, and we have more branching, is opposite of what you have the normal human beings, okay. But here, of course, they use my system to understand. And so therefore, it's very critical to understand that when people have hypertension, it affects their vasculature permanently, because hypertension leads to, uh, uh, affects the distribution of the VEGF and VEGF, a receptor expression, and therefore it affects the branching events, and hence it affects the vasculature, uh, a physical network. So, we talked about the uh, broad overview about the uh, uh, angiogenesis, what are the mechanisms involved, and lumen formations. We talked about the role, uh, ma molecular mechanisms in cancer, and also non cancerous processes, and so forth. So, now we know that the GAGs have a role to play everywhere. So now how we can use this knowledge uh, to make the molecule that can be used to prevent angiogenesis, uh, which is not required in cases like a cancer. And uh, so there is so much of investigations going on all over the world. And uh, so one obvious target is a heparinase inhibitor. And the heparinase enzyme which cleaves a, a heparin sulfur to smaller fragments. And there's a molecule called PA88 and which is not heparin sulfate, which is basically a phosphorylated, R stands for the phosphate groups. So all these R's are the phosphate groups, okay, and you have also the R1 uh, is a sulfate group some places, okay, and the PA88 uh, one is basically the phosphate groups. 
So you got a lot of okay, phosphates and they call uh, phospho, you know what they call Karthik? Phosphomano, right? Yeah. So it's a phosph. Yeah. So this P A T is basically now have the phosphate groups instead of having sulfate groups, and then it thereby competes with the heparan sulfate with the VEGF, and also it binds to the heparanase enzyme and inhibits heparanase enzyme and thereby prevents the heparan sulfate cleavage. And it has more than one role to play, but the end result is that uh, it blocks uh, and it helps people, okay, it blocks on genesis and it uh, have better outcome in cancer patients. And so this table that summarizes all the clinical trials that's going on uh, and so what's the current status and so forth. But the PA88 is definitely is a very, very promising one. So there's another enzyme which I haven't uh, time to talk about before is that the sulfs is a sulfatase enzyme. It's like a heparinase which cleaves the heparin sulfate into smaller fragments. Sulfs are the enzyme called sulfatases, which by name as indicates, it removes the sulfate group. In particular, the sulfs remove the 6O sulfate groups of the heparin sulfate. And so what happens is that when you, which is also expressed in the cancer uh, tissues and which plays a role in angenosis and uh, so what happens is that you have a heparin sulfate here, protoglycan, which binds to both VEGF and VEGF, sorry, FGF and FGF receptors, which triggers signaling. But what happens is that when you have a sulf expressed and secreted into the cell, extracellular matrix and cell surface, and that removes the 6 sulfate groups, okay, in particular 6 sulfate groups are removed by sulf enzyme, but removing 6 sulfate group, which is required for the FGF receptor binding, and that's what triggers FGF receptor dimerization and triggers the signaling. But now, by removing 6 sulfate group, the heparin sulfate can bind to the FGF, but cannot bind to the receptor anymore. But binding to both FGF and FGF receptor is required for triggering the signaling complex formation and the signaling. But now what happens is that now with sulfone treated heparin sulfate protoglycan, the sulfone is secreted, it goes and, and cleaves the 6 sulfate groups, which is the red ones, and thereby it can preserve the binding ability to FGF, but lost the ability to bind to FGF receptor. As a result, that now they can dimerize, and therefore, therefore, reduce for signaling, and therefore, there's a okay, and this is what is happening, uh, and uh, so then, what is interesting is that you can use the heparin molecule, see whether they can compete, and when you take the heparin, this is a heparin sulfate protoglycan, heparin sulfate protoglycan, and you take the heparin and throw it, and you, you think that it's going to compete, but that's not that much is actually doing the heparin. In the independent of heparin sulfate protoglycan, which is bound to the cell surface, can bind to both FGF and FGF receptor, and they can trigger the signaling, and uh, so that's happening. Uh, okay, uh, so what happens is that even though you have a sulf one here, and that removes the sulfate groups from the heparin sulfate protoglycan, but when you add exogenous heparin sulfate or heparin-like molecule, which still have a six sulfate group, and that can just do the job just like that by binding to both FGF and FGF receptor that trigger the signaling. But when you take the heparin, treat with the sulf one enzyme exogenously, and then throw them into the cell culture model, then what happens is that there is a reduced angiogenesis, reduced signaling, and reduced angiogenesis. Because now, what happens is that now you have uh, the heparin sulfate with uh, less 6 sulfate groups binds to the FGF only, but whereas the FGF receptor uh, can cannot bind to the FGF, and by this one, endogenous things can still bind to FGF receptor, but you need FGF2, okay, without FGF, and uh, okay, then FGF receptor, and they cannot dimerize effectively, then they don't have a signaling complex, uh, which is okay, summarized here. And when you look at the FGF2 alone, you have a lot of angiosis going on. When you take FGF2 plus the heparin, even though it's in the, uh, they have a lot of sulfatase is secreted, uh, or they have a mutated sulfatase 1, and there is no change, because heparin, doesn't function like an antagonist and sequestering the heparin uh, FGF out completely, but still can trigger the signaling complex and therefore it can trigger the angenosis. But what happens is that you take FGF2 and then you mix with the sulfate treated heparin and then it prevents the FGF2 from binding to the heparin sulfate cell surface and thereby it reduces the angenosis dramatically and by affecting the signaling pathway. This is what's shown. So therefore, it just it exemplifies the importance of the sulfation pattern and how now this is screwed up in the cancer uh, uh, populations where the sulfate is secreted, therefore it affects. And now number of groups are trying to make the inhibitors for sulfatase, including our own lab is working on. 
uh, in collaboration with Dr. Desai's group, and screening number of gag mimetics, which can possibly can in inhibit sulfatases. We have some success, and so we need to uh, elaborate more on that. And also, one of my students, Karthik, is here, is also looking at how we can use the protoglycans, uh, mimetics, which again, we got a number of compounds from Dr. Desai's groups, and which are basically not the gags, but gag mimetics, they're polysulfonated uh, organic scaffolds, which could mimic the protoglycan, thereby can compete with the VEGF, and VEGF receptors interactions, it can compete with heparinases, and also can inhibit sulfatases, and all of the pathways where the heparin sulfate have a pro antigen effect now by competing with the heparin sulfate with the gag mimetics, now they can have an anti antigenic effect. And so that's where we stand on that. So I said so much about uh, glycanoglycan so far, but please know that there are also other glycans, which we're going to pick up now in Cialic acid when we talk about. They also play a role. One of the major molecules that's you know, very critical that you know, so know that GM3, which is a gangliocyte, and which is basically a gangliocyte which has a single Cialic acid, which is GM3. And so this GM3 and the GD3, and it affects uh, apoptosis, and it affects the growth factor signaling, in particular EGF receptors, and it also increases antigenesis, and therefore, not just the glycanoglycan that we talked so far that plays a role uh, in the tumor pathophysiology and pathology uh, and tumor and genesis. Also, this other glycans plays a major role, in particular uh, the GM3 and GD3 in the angiogenesis and cell motilities and cell differentiation, cell migration, uh, and also the things that we talked so far about cell-cell interactions. Okay, and so it's not just one molecule gag that's enough but there are also other molecules involved in angiogenesis and tumor biology, and we don't have time to pick it up now on this angiogenesis topic, but we're gonna pick up some of these molecules, GM3 and GD3, when we talk about sialic acid. So I'm gonna stop here now, and I don't think we have time to talk about inflammation and how it's linked to the angiogenesis, and, but you should know that angiogenesis is linked to the inflammation, and the inflammation is linked to the coagulations, and the coagulation is linked to the angiogenesis. This is a complex pathway, angiogenesis to inflammation, inflammation to coagulations, coagulations to angiogenesis, and there's a lot of crosstalks between all these pathways, and that leads to the uh, pathological process. I think I'm gonna stop here now.